Good morning. Uh, this is morning prayer, and uh, you may have noticed, I've said for a couple of weeks now, that you will notice that things have changed a little bit on our YouTube channel. If you would like to have, to be able to sing along with the hymns, then uh, please send our church an email and we can get you the Zoom link. Uh, we are broadcasting our live church services Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and I invite you to be able to, to join in with that if that's uh, what you so desire. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be leading us in morning prayer from the Book of Alternative Services, and I'll make sure there's a link in the description of this video so that you will be able to uh, have an have a electronic version of the prayer book as well as the readings. I invite you to sit quietly and to pull back your shoulders, to close your eyes, and use your mind, your contemplation to center yourself on what we're about to do. Draw your mind onto God and try to keep your mind on God throughout the service. So we'll just take a few moments just to do that. Turn to page 45 of the Book of Alternative Services. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them return to the Lord, and he will have compassion. And to our God, for he will richly pardon. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We turn to page 47. And there's actually a way to sing these, these introductory prayers, so maybe I'll, we'll try that today. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the 
beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is our light and our life. O come, let us worship. The Vanity on page 49. And again, there is a way to sing this. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship. Our psalm today is Psalm 19. Actually, we're going to do our readings uh, in the normal Eucharistic way. So we'll have our Old Testament reading first. Our Old Testament reading is from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 to 33. Chapter 1, verses 20 to 33. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, Behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you have refused to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded, because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will come, call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way, and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure, and will be at ease without dread of disaster. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll now turn to our psalm, which is Psalm 19. In the BAS, that's found on page 725. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun, 
It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our next reading is from James's letter. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now turn to our gospel reading. Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, 
Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that we would understand your word, and that your word would be planted deep in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our readings today, we have a common theme of wisdom and speaking. A priest I know recently posted about the Proverbs uh, from a book that he's reading by someone named Ellen Davis. She is a theologian and an Old Testament scholar. It's, it's a neat little quote. She says this, what the book of Proverbs underwrites is a worldview closer to this motto seen posted over the door of an automobile repair shop. Wisdom is the ability to anticipate consequences. And we see that in our reading how wisdom is kind of laughing at those who didn't heed her warning. Um, and James, too, is giving us a lot of wisdom today. He's giving us warning today regarding the consequences of how we use our words. There's danger in speaking, and because it's so easy to misspeak or say things that we later regret. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And we wish that was true, <laughs> but it's, we know, uh, you know many of us would have rather been hit in the gut with a, a good swift punch rather than hear some of the things that people have said to us. Words can cut, they can sting, and they can sting for years and years and years. Uh, words can end a lifelong friendship. Uh, words can mean that two family members never talk to each other again. Words can crush the ambitions and dreams of a child. Words can cause us to spiral into a depression. So this is the small spark that James talks about that can set the forest on fire. But it's not that words can be only used negatively. We know that, right? That words can also be used powerfully. We can praise God with our words. They can, be motivate, they can motivate us to do good and motivate others to do good. The words of Jesus have changed the world for the better. Uh, many of us remember the words of someone who encouraged us. And we remember them as if they were said to us yesterday. Just as much as those words that were said to us that cut still are fresh in our minds. We can still remember a look on the person's face. Well, that, that's equally true when someone is, speaks an especially encouraging word to us when we need to hear it. A eulogy can bring us to tears for love of a person that, that we've lost. So words can be incredibly powerful, and I don't want to underestimate the good that they can do, but James seems to be wanting us to be 
particularly warned about the bad that they can do. So words are powerful. And because we easily make mistakes with our words, we should be very careful because of the great harm that they can cause. James makes this very interesting connection between our words and our lives. He says that our words are like a bit in the mouth of a horse or a rudder on a ship. So they're both small, but they're used to direct. Uh, one is used to direct a large horse. The other is used to direct a large ship. Because they're small, we might be tempted to discount them or not think that they're all that important. But that would be a mistake. And James is saying that our words, like our tongue, that has the power to direct our lives. And that isn't a connection that we often make. And I think he might be suggesting that disciplining our words is connected to disciplining our lives. Right? The, the energy and the skill and the grace it takes to discipline our tongue is very comparable to the grace and discipline and energy it takes to discipline our lives. So for example, uh, we know people who work in the trades and they can sometimes have colorful words that we would rather our children not get used to hearing. And so they make an effort when they are visiting with us to try to not use those words. And once in a while, they slip up. They just get comfortable. They let their guard down. They slip up, and one of these words slips out. So they, they don't have complete mastery over their words. Uh, they don't have complete mastery over their tongue. It's a habit that's hard to break. And it's especially hard to break when you're suddenly at a toddler's birthday party after you've just been at work for a couple of weeks or so. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. This is Luke chapter 6, verse 45. And I'm not saying my friends are evil. <laughs> just saying that out of the heart the mouth speaks. Uh, and this reflects Jesus' words from a couple of Sundays ago, and I quoted him last week as well. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, evil, sorry, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. So our words express something that's going on inside of us. Right? It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. In the list that I just read, uh, Jesus includes deceit and slander. And these are particularly connected to words. So deceit and slander. We use our words in those particular ways and those particular sins. The scriptures warn us in many other places about other ways that we can sin with our words. So for example, verbal abuse, cursing, boasting, quarreling, lying. Those are, there's many other ways that we can sin with our words. And they're particularly mentioned, these different kinds of, of sinning with the, sinnings with the mouth. And maybe we're saying something about swearing. Uh, swearing is generally words that express contempt. And contempt is not a good thing for a Christian. Um, contempt is right there with, with anger. Uh, you might remember Jesus in... In the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's chapter 5, he says that, um, I've said to you that, you know, he's talking about murder. And he relates anger to murder, saying that anger is sort of the seed of murder. But he says that, if you say to your brother, Racha, that you're liable to judgment. Right? This Racha was kind of uh, believed by some to be 
coming from the sound of producing spit in your mouth, as if you're going to spit on somebody. So saying racha to somebody is like it's like you fool. It is a it is a word. It is a, a sound and a word of contempt, like you're about to spit on somebody, like you think nothing of them. So we should be very careful about contemptuous words. So swearing, like using vulgar language, this is a, a way of expressing contempt, either for a situation or for other people. Just think of the swear words you know. They are usually contemptuous words. So if we habitually swear using these contemptuous words, they can have the effect of reinforcing a contemptuous view of the world and the people around us. Right? So there's there's something about the, the building up of the heart where the mouth is sort of, uh, it speaks because the heart has full up and it spills out of the mouth. But there's also something about words that can have an effect the other direction as well. These words can reinforce an attitude of the heart. If we speak with these kinds of contemptuous words, it can also reinforce that view in others around us. You, know, you get a group of people together and they're all using these words. The, the attitude of the group can quite consistently degrade and become, uh, the, the, the view of the world can become quite contemptuous within the group. So it can affect others. It, it can encourage others to think that way about the world. It's very similar to if we are constantly complaining about what is wrong with our life. It is likely that we are reinforcing a negative view of life, which opposes the gratitude that we are called to cultivate. So our words overflow from the attitude of the heart. Our words also seem to reinforce that thinking in our own hearts and maybe even help that attitude spread to others. For example, some people use self-talk. They might, if they're trying to motivate themselves and they're feeling afraid or anxious, they might tell themselves, yeah, you can do it, go do it. Right? They'll look in the mirror, right? And I suspect that that can work with negative words as well, negative self-talk. Now, I think there is a place for just honestly expressing what's inside of you. It, this isn't about just bottling things up and never saying how you really feel. I don't think that's helpful. But I think James is also trying to show us that words are very, very powerful. So we should be very cautious with how we use them, especially if they're coming out of us in a way that is attacking or cutting other people. James also tells us about the inconsistency in our speaking. He says, with it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. This is James 3, verses 9 and 10. So it's interesting to hold this actually alongside our gospel reading for today, where Peter answers Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? And he answers that question with a faithful response. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. In 8.29. But then Peter starts to rebuke Jesus. Right? Like, rebuke is a very strong word. It's, it's to give Jesus trouble. He's pulling him aside and really giving him what for. And why is he doing this? He's doing this because he's trying to correct Jesus on his view of what the, being the Messiah is all about. Jesus is saying that he is supposed to suffer and die at the hands of the authorities. And for Peter, that is just absolutely inconsistent with the idea of the Messiah. So he has to correct him. And Peter's rebuke shows his human understanding of the Messiah's role. And in a way, he was kind of ashamed of Jesus' words. He was and so Peter was tempting Jesus away from the cross, and so standing in his way, which is Satan's role. 
Fresh and salt water were both pouring forth from the fa same fountain. Peter had too human a view of the Messiah, and his words expressed the ignorance within his heart. And I don't think anyone is suggesting this is easy. Uh, even James says, anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect. I don't think he would think anyone is perfect. <laughs> right? So he's not expecting perfection from us. This is 3 verse 2. He also says, every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. This is 3 verses 7 and 8. So he's, he's recognizing the impossibility of taming the tongue. And of course, this is impossible without God. Though I do think that this, we have to desire this deeply. We have to desire to have this kind of grace to control our, our words, to keep them from harming others, to keep them from reinforcing negative and attitudes that are not a part of the kingdom of God. We don't want those words reinforcing that in our hearts. So this has to be a true desire of ours, and I think that as evidence of that true desire, we have to put effort into this. I think too often we just pray that God would change us without us putting any effort in, and I think that that actually shows that we really don't desire it. And some people get all worked up when I say things like that because they, they say, well, you can't earn this. It's like, no, 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 you can't. Right? And Dallas Willard is big on saying, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. So through your effort, you can never earn the grace needed to be able to control your words. But effort will display the desire. The effort itself is a prayer, is a reaching out to God for that change to happen so that we can be of more use to God in the world. We can be evidence of God's kingdom even here on earth. Amen. I invite you to consider what God might be saying to you through those readings. We'll say the Apostles' Creed together. This is a creed that has united Christians around the world in many different language, languages throughout time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. I'll leave spaces so that you can insert your own, uh, what you want to pray for, into the spaces. Let us pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. Lord, hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share the good things you provide. Lord, hear our prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind. Lord, hear our prayer. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying, and your comfort to those who mourn. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us so to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may turn to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining me for morning prayer. God bless you.